And early this morning in my prayer time, uh, let me just kind of tell you a little bit about what's happened since I saw you last. Because last Tuesday night, you know, God just wrecked us. He wrecked this room. He wrecked all of our lives. And we just walked into a holy moment. I, I got in my car and I drove for three hours because I was supposed to preach the next day. I was actually supposed to be there that night and I, I wanted to be here. So I was here instead. And so um, I can say no. Some of you think I can't, but I can say no. And I am saying no a lot more than you think I am. I just have to say yes a lot to whom much is given, much is required, right? And so I can't say no all the time. And so I got in my car and I drove, and the next morning, um, the glory of God just fell in the room. My goodness. Uh, I, I, I didn't give an altar call. Uh, I, I preached, and, and I, I preached a sermon the Lord gave me, and I didn't give an altar call, but the altar just filled up while I was still preaching. It just filled up. I was nearing the end of my sermon, and it just filled up. I mean, literally from one side, I was in the Sevierville Convention Center, and uh, up there in, in Sevierville, in Pigeon Forge, in Gatlinburg area, I was preaching at the Sevierville Convention Center, and it just literally filled up with hundreds of people all across the front. And then that turned into the Holy Ghost fall in the room, and we just shouted and danced till we were wore out. I mean, and I love moments like that with God. And, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't want anything to take that from me. Some people thought that I was, I'm kind of, I've had a few Macaws in my life that said, you know, you're undignified. Do you have your doctorate? You're the president of this. I said, I don't care, man. I'm going to dance like David dance because I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing it for him. And it doesn't, titles, education, none of that should take away your praise. Especially if God's picked you up from where he picked me up from and taken me through what he's taken me through and pulled me out of battles the way he has. I will not sit down or the rocks will cry out for me. I mean, I'm a testimony, man. And if God's brought you through that, you just always want to give him praise. And so, and then the next day, this, the same thing happened. The, the glory fell once again in the room. And then um, I went from there to Hamilton, Alabama, where I've been preaching at the ramp and and uh, I want to tell you, um, I was there till yesterday, and I got home late last night from preaching at the ramp. And my goodness, you know, I've been to ramp conferences, but, but the ramp school, that is off the chain. I'm telling you, it is something else to be in there with all of those hungry, hundreds and hundreds of just hungry young people just going after God with all their heart. And, and the glory fell. I mean, it, I, I can't describe it any other way. The glory fell, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what's going on there just since that happened, something that is, else is going on. If you haven't heard about it, I'm going to tell you about that. So I've been in all this since last week. So I've been in the glory after glory after glory after glory, just waves of it, and I'll go to another place, and the glory falls there. It's not because I'm there. It's just because I'm following the cloud. It's his glory. I can't even bring the glory. All I'm doing is walking in obedience. And so this morning when I got up, you know, I'm just in this place with God. And the Lord says, I don't want you to preach what, he, what you want to preach. I want you to fan the flames of revival. And so I'm going to tell you some things I've been telling you ever since you've known me. Some of the things I'm going to tell you, you have heard me say over and over again. And I've got to tell you about this journey that God has had me on for a while. I have, um, I have been prophesying that a revival was coming to this earth for years I have literally been, if you've heard me preach years ago, you heard me saying that. I have been prophesying that the glory is coming. I have been trying to get the body of Christ ready for something that we don't know what to call. We've never seen it because God's about to move cool instead of hot. And we're so used to God moving hot. And we don't always know how to walk with God in the cool of the day. We've, we haven't always, we, 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 we're so used to the anointing that sometimes we don't understand that the glory is the opposite of that. It's times of refreshing that come in the presence of the Lord. And I'll tell you, the glory doesn't need a preacher. The glory doesn't need a singer. The glory doesn't need a musician. The glory doesn't need an amen corner. When God decides to just step down in a room by himself, he don't need anybody's permission. He'll do it at the airport, at a local church, at a Baptist church, at a Methodist college. I mean, wherever he wants to fall, the Lord will just step in there and do it and let 
let the glory fall the way he wants to. And I've known this was coming for years for many, many reasons. I preached a sermon years ago called The Prophet's Revival, and I walked through the prophet. I walked through all the prophets that foretold this end-time move of God. I've been challenged on it over and over. I was preaching a camp meeting last summer, and, and one night I just preached on this end-time move of God, and, and even the, a lot of the ministers stood around and tried to talk me out of it. And I said, guys, let me tell you something. You just come along a little too late. You don't have to believe it. But I believe you're going to see it with your own eyes. And one of these days, you're going to have to eat some crow because you're trying to tell me it's not going to happen. I'm trying to tell you it's going to happen. The, th the dove of Noah is about to fly, the third flight of the dove. Uh, some of you have heard me talk about that. The first flight of the dove was the moving of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. The second flight of the dove was the moving of the Holy Spirit in the church in the New Testament. But that period comes to an end, and then the dove flies one more time, and there's nothing but glory. After that, God opens the door. God sends the rain. God gives them a new beginning. God does it by himself. And I've just been waiting on this final flight of the dove. I've just believed, I've said it over and over. I know people have challenged me saying, so you're telling me that the rapture can't take place until this happens. And I'm saying, no, I'm not telling you that at all because there's going to be a revival after the rapture takes place. There's going to be more people get saved after the rapture takes place than that we have seen in years before the rapture gets placed. So no, a revival is coming even then. But what I'm telling you is that for God to finish the dance of the Trinity, for God to finish the third Pentecost, for all these things to come to pass, there has to be another altar call for a younger generation that has not grown up in the healing revivals and the tent revivals and in those great moves of God. God is bringing a revival to the earth. And so I've preached about this for years. So I want to talk real quickly and go ahead and load me up there on the screens, guys, and we'll just kind of move back and forth from where we are. But I want to talk on fanning the flames of revival, fanning the flames of revival. And so the first thing I want to talk to you about is something in Genesis chapter 26. And again, I, I, I don't know if I'm calling this, this is not a point A to Z type sermon at all. So I'm going to be, I'm going to be moving around a little bit in this sermon. But the first thing I want you to see is that in Genesis 26, there's this principle where Isaac was digging out the wells of his fathers because there was blessings in these wells. And even the psalmist David says that we need to call out to the wells. The deep calls out to deep and says, spring up, O well, spring up, O well. So what you need to understand is where God has moved before, God will move again. If there is a well of revival there, some people call them portals, so a portal would be like a staircase that angels go up and down. Uh, so, so that would be like an open blessing, a place where blessings fall. Years ago, I was listening to Pastor Tony Scott preach, and, and this was a long time ago, and he said, there's a day that's coming when I see this black canopy over the earth, and then all of a sudden, it looked like God shot cannonballs through the canopy, and there were beams of light that started coming down through the darkness. And he said, I can't explain it any other way, but I see thousands and thousands of portals opening up in heaven and they're connecting with revival wells. And when he said that, I'm, no one was preaching that in those days. And honestly, I didn't even hardly know how to digest it. I'm thinking beams of light from heaven and cannonballs and connecting with, with, with wells. I get it now. He's talking about portals and he's talking about holy ground where God is moved. So in this principle you have, you have in Genesis 26, you have this whole concept of where God has moved before, God will move again. Where the wells were dug by the forefathers, if you can dig those wells of revival out again, and I'm telling you, we're sitting in one in Cleveland, Tennessee. There is a revival well at Lee University. The Lee University has had waves of revivals. There was, I was, when I was a college student there, there was a great revival broke out when I was a college student there. And that's been a while back, and we won't go there, but it's been a while back, but I'm telling you, there's waves of revival where the North Cleveland Church sits. There are waves of revival. When T.O. Lowry built that building, he was the pastor there, and they had great, mighty moves of God and 
powerful revivals that you would see miracles happen night after night after night. There's been, there's been prophecies over this city. For William Branham prophecies over this city that one day there's been the urban, uh, urbane road revival prophecy that there's going to be a revival that takes place on this property. And, and I remember during COVID when, when, um, when I was preaching in an empty building because I was the, I was the one, I was kind of filling in the gap, making up the hedge for a while. And so they asked me, would you just come on Tuesday nights? And no one could come out. I mean, we were all shut down and I was preaching in an empty building and I was sitting there. There might've been six people in this building. And I was up here preaching up a storm, man, like the room was full. And I started prophesying to this room. And I said, I will see this room full. There will be young people from one corner to the other corner. And I'm telling you, I would stand here while they were worshiping and I just prophesied to this room. It's a, to an empty room. I was just prophesying to this room and I'd get up here and preach like the room was full because in my spirit, I saw it full. I knew one of these days what I was seeing in my spirit would come to pass. And so for years and years and years, I've been believing that God was going to send a mighty move of God on the earth at the end of time that the hearts of the fathers will be turned back to the sons and the hearts of the sons back to the father. Some of you that heard my sermon a, a few months ago on these are the days of Elijah, that's one you ought to go back and look at again because I explained that that is tied to one specific prophecy or that prophecy is tied to one specific miracle where Elijah raised a dead boy from the, from the grave, the widow of Zarephath's son, but it wasn't just any boy, it was Jonah. Jonah's father was Amittai, and the widow of Zarephath's husband was Amittai, so it was, he was raising Jonah, the same Jonah that gets swallowed by the well, same guy who had one assignment on his life, and that was to bring revival to the capital of Assyria. That was his only assignment, and out of all the miracles that that Elijah did, he only prayed one prayer for those miracles except this time. And he prays three prayers to resurrect this little boy because of the three moves of God that would come on this earth, starting with the day of Pentecost and then the Azusa Street Revival would go around the world and then there's got to be one more. There's got to be one more move of God to complete the dance of the Trinity, perichoresis. We've been, I've been talking about all this stuff for a long time, it's been in my spirit. And so I knew that with my own eyes, I believed with my own heart and my own eyes, I would see this one day. And so I believe last summer was my summer for digging out wells. And I told some of you about it. God had me on one of the weirdest journeys I've ever been on. I started in the month of June and I was going to graveyards and praying and old sites where old churches had been torn down and praying and God would send me to these places and tell me to call out to the well. I was afraid to tell anybody because I'm thinking they're going to think okay Dr. B has gone off the deep end now. I don't know if he's going to come back to us or not because he's out there talking to graveyards and calling out to broken down churches and, and so and God told me to do that and I went to several places where the Lord sent me and I called out to wells and I promised prophesied over them and, and asked them to come back. Even some churches that were in trouble, some churches that were in transition, God sent me to the property and I would stand there where the, I thought the well was and I'd call to the deep and call it to come out. It was a strange journey, but I really believe that God had me doing that prophetically over the land. And so, so when you understand this, it takes us to Joel chapter 2, which Joel chapter 2 is the prophecy that, every, that I've been looking looking for. Now, you have to understand this about Joel chapter 2. I understand that Peter quoted this on the day of Pentecost. This is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel, but he did not quote the whole prophecy, and the reason he couldn't quote the whole prophecy is because it's the third prophecy of Joel chapter 2. The first prophecy of Joel chapter 2 is the diaspora, that the Jewish people will be persecuted and scattered around the earth. That's the first prophecy. The second prophecy is that they would gather back into the homeland. That didn't happen until May 1948. And then he said afterwards. So this is way after the day of Pentecost. This is a long time after the day of Pentecost. Afterwards, he said, I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons, your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and my maid servants, 
I will pour out of my spirit in those days. And when the Lord gave me a revelation about men's servants and maid servants, I started looking for something, and I don't know who else was looking for it, but I started looking for something because I believe, if you read Hebrew, you read it from right to left, and I believed that the revival would begin in a Muslim country. And the reason I believe that is because if you go to men's servants, notice the language changes your sons, your daughters. That's easy to identify. That's us. And then he switches language and says, and also on my men servants and my maid servants. What was he talking about? Well, the law of first mention tells us what he was referring to. The first time in the Bible the word men servant is mentioned is talking about the sons of Abraham. And the first time in the Bible that the word maid servant is mentioned is talking about Hagar, who is the mother of Islam. And when I read that, when the Lord gave me that revelation, I shared it with some, some friends that pastor in the largest Muslim country in the world, which is Indonesia. And shortly after that, something broke out, a revival broke out in Indonesia, and, and in this revival, you have to understand true revival brings repentance and true revival, true revival doesn't just bring joy, it does bring joy, but true revival brings repentance and it brings salvation. There's a conviction, a fear of the Lord that comes with true revival and people start confessing and people start, I mean, they. You, you, it's amazing the things that they get convicted of and they just start confessing things and apologizing that's what real revival looks like, you know. It's not just happy all the time. It's people coming to God broken and laying down their sins and, and God taking people that are strung out in addiction and killing them and curing them and sobering them and giving them a whole new lease on life. That's what real revival looks like. So, so I've been looking for something like this that would come along and so I've shared a video with you guys one time in one of the sermons that has to do with this, but this is, this is one of the largest churches in the world. And this guy is actually a personal friend of mine, Pastor Nico. He pastors in Indonesia. As a matter of fact, Carrie, uh, she's right here on the, I ask you guys to sit there. Carrie, I want you to stand up. I want them to see you because she's a witness. She was in the building in Indonesia when this prophecy was given out by Cindy Jacobs over him. So she was there. That video I showed you, she she was actually in Indonesia with Campus Choir, I think it was, uh, in this meeting from Lee University and heard this prophecy given out that the third Pentecost would be poured out and would go from east to west instead of from west to east as the Azusa Street Revival went. And so I've kept up with Pastor Nico. I've talked to him. I've Zoomed with him and kept with him over this. He's written a book about it. He's held third Pentecost conferences now. And I've shared some of the stories with you where he told me that one night the glory of God fell in their kids' church. And his, his church runs 550,000 people. It's enormous. So we don't see churches that big here in the United States, but but his, his got one of the largest churches in the world, in the largest Muslim country in the world, which is a phenomenon all by itself because they're still dealing with persecution there, and his church is amazing. And this is what he told me. He said, one night the glory of God fell and that over 8,000 children in their children's church were slain in the spirit and spoke in tongues until the sun came up the next morning. He said they literally spoke in tongues for hours upon hours. They would not wake up. They could not get them up off the ground. And they spoke in tongues until the sun came up the next morning. And they saw that this was a sign from God. And so this whole third Pentecost movement, the last time I talked to him, I said, tell me about the third Pentecost movement in Indonesia. So it started there when this prophecy was given out at that time, which has been a couple of years ago now when this happened. It was actually right around. Right Around, uh, right before COVID or right around that time when this, when this prophecy was poured out. And the last time I spoke with him, he said that there are tens of thousands of teenage Muslims coming to Christ every single week now. He said, we don't even have the room for them. We don't know what to do with them. They, have, they are so tired of radical Islam. They're so tired of hating everybody. They're so tired of being hyped up to go out and murder people. He said, they have found the love 
love of Christ, they are being filled with the Holy Spirit and literally tens of thousands of them in a, the largest Muslim country. So Hagar is getting the outpouring. Hagar, it's already started. The ha Hagar is getting the outpouring. And so I knew that eventually it would come to this part of the world. And so, so I, I've read some of these prophecies to you before, but I want to just kind of recap some of them. This is one from Smith Wigglesworth. Listen to what he said. I see it. I see it. Shutting his eyes again, he said, I see the greatest revival in the history of mankind coming to planet Earth, maybe as never before, and I see the dead raised, and I see every form of disease healed, and I will not see it in my lifetime, but I see it in my spirit. It is coming. He saw a revival that was coming to this Earth, and right before he died, he wrote that, and we're still talking about it today. This is Dr. Lester Summerall, who also said this before he passed away. He's in heaven now too. I see a revival coming that will not last long, but it will come upon young men and women who are not well known or even greatly appreciated. It's not going to be a celebrity led revival. It's not even going to be a pastor led revival. It's not going to be a leader led revival. It's going to be a grassroots movement where God is coming upon young men and young women who have never preached a sermon and all they're doing is just beginning to walk in the spirit and do what the spirit is leading them to do and it's not going to make sense to everybody that needs a bulletin it's not going to make sense to everybody that needs a program it's not going to make sense to everybody that thinks you got to have a praise team for the glory to fall it's not going to make sense for everybody that thinks you got to have a prayer line and a fire tunnel to get the glory in the house it's not going to make sense to everybody that thinks you got to have that because when God begins to move and these young people they're not going after religion they're going after glory they're going after a divine move of God that is unlike anything that perhaps that we've ever seen in our lifetime. I love this one by David Wilkerson. Listen to what he said. And he, this kind of pins it to our day and time. I see a plague coming on the world, and the bars and churches and government will shut down. The plague will hit New York City and shake it like it has never been shaken. The plague is going to force prayerless believers into radical prayer and into their Bibles, and repentance. Everybody say repentance. And repentance will be the cry from the man of God in the pulpit, and out of it will come the third great awakening that will sweep America and the world. How many of you know we've just come through that pandemic? We've just come through the only thing that's ever shut New York City down, the only thing that's ever shut this country down like that. We've come through that. He said right after that. So now he's pinned it for us. He's put it on the calendar and said after the pandemic is over, get ready because we're Revival is coming, but he's not the only one that said it. Here is from Azusa Street, the 100-year prophecy from Azusa Street. And he did not say it was going to happen exactly at any time. He said 100 years from now, the greatest revival in the history of the world will occur. They will, be, they will witness the fullness of the former and the latter reigns of God. They will see the Shekinah glory manifested in its fullness. I want you to look at the date that he died. He died in September 28th. 1922. It's now been a hundred years and a few months. So we're right in the time frame of that hundred year prophecy. He didn't say on the day. He said a hundred years from now. So we are right now in the time frame of that hundred year prophecy. But it doesn't stop there. Bob Jones prophesied this before he died. And he told this to several people. He said it to the point that people thought that he was kind of out of it because, first of all, this team had not won a Super Bowl in 50 years, and they were certainly not in line to win a Super Bowl. And Bob Jones, so even even uh, some of the, like Sean Boats and some of those guys who are Shane Boats, some of those guys that have prophecy ministries. He said that he told him this at least 10 times. He said, "When the Kansas City Chiefs win the Super Bowl, revival is coming." And he said, Don't, he said, it's going to happen. You wait and see when they win the Super Bowl. Well, guess what? They won the Super Bowl in 2020. And the revival, he, we thought the revival didn't come 
But the revival did come in 2020 in Indonesia. That's when it started there. So the revival came in the, in the, in the, in the east and now is moving to the west. And wouldn't you know it just be like the Lord to take a team like the Kansas City, the Kansas City Chiefs, and three years later bring them back again to win another Super Bowl. And I know that some of you are Philly fans, and I'm sorry that you're so disappointed because of what happened on se- uh, on on a Sunday night. But you need to understand this. He said, "When the when the." Kansas City Chiefs win the Super Bowl, that's the earmark for revival. Now, who, somebody tell me who the Kansas City Chiefs were playing? The Eagles. What's interesting about this to me is simultaneously, when the Super Bowl is being played, there's another group who are also called the Eagles, who are in a different battle at Asbury University. The Asbury University Athletics Department are called the Asbury Eagles. And it's interesting that God, you can say that's just coincidence and it might be, but somehow that connects with me to say God is giving us signs. God is give, God is trying to talk to us. He is trying to wake us up to see that he's speaking plain English now. They have won the Super Bowl And now there's a revival breaking out at a place called the Eagles. And it's amazing. It's interesting to me what God is doing in Asbury College. And it's only like a week old now, and it's still going strong. As a matter of fact, you're going to hear in a moment from some people that have been to the Asbury Revival, and I've asked them to speak in a few moments and just share a little bit about their experience there. But one of the interviews that I saw that really blessed me is that they had had a normal chapel and chapel had been dismissed, and their gospel choir was singing that day for chapel, and that after everybody went to class, the gospel choir kept singing, and 30 people stayed. And from those, all the other students went back to class. It wasn't like a big eruption. It wasn't like a a big celebration broke loose in chapel. Everyone went back a normal day. But 30 people stayed and started seeking God. And that choir kept singing. And before you know it, the glory of God started falling upon that small group at Asbury. And then the president of the college sent out an email to all the students saying, they're still in the chapel service. If you want to go, you can miss your class and go to chapel. All the students ran there. Wasn't wasn't that something? What a great move for the president of Asbury. They all went to the chapel and and then all since that time it is not shut down 24 hours a day do you, do you understand what the Azusa Street revival was i mean I, I i haven't preached on it a lot but in case you don't know what the Azusa Street revival was it wasn't like what we call revival we call revival a series of worship services in the same week you know, we would call a revival Monday through, let's have a revival Monday through Friday. And we would come and sing songs and preach sermons and have altar calls. That's, that's what most people know as revival. The Azusa Street wasn't like that. The Azusa Street revival did not shut down for three and a half years. It was 24 hours a day, and it was mostly prayer. They didn't have bands. There was, it was, it's, it's what I'm seeing now. It is somebody just starts singing a song and everybody else starts joining in and somebody stands up and gives a testimony. That's how it started. And for three and a half years in the Azusa Street meeting, a meeting that literally swept the world, it was not it was not conducted in program. It was not leader led. I know William Seymour gets the credit for it because a lot of miracles came through him, but William Seymour didn't even attend all the services. And you know, if you know anything about that story, he would go in, they had two crates. They didn't have a real pulpit because this was an old warehouse that they had turned into a, a meeting place, and he didn't have a real pulpit. He had two crates that he laid his Bible on when he preached. So that was the pulpit when he did preach. And they said that he would come in, he lived in an apartment upstairs, and he would come in and stick his head in the crate. He would get on his knees and stick his head inside the crate, and they just waited on the Lord. But they said when the Lord would give him a word, like one of the stories of Azusa is that they would bring in people that were sick, they would bring in, and one night they had a whole section of wheelchairs there Azusa of people that had come in that could not walk and that when William Seymour got 
got his head out of the crate, he lifted up his head and said, the Holy Spirit said that everyone in the wheelchair section will get healed tonight. And he said, just like that, no fanfare, no drum roll, nobody hyped up. He said, everybody in that section started standing up out of their wheelchairs and every single one of them got healed because God was doing a sovereign work that could not be duplicated, a sovereign work that could not be imitated or mimicked in any way. It was such a sovereign move of the Lord. And, and one of the things that they talked about is the Shekinah glory of God. Now, every time Shekinah falls, it's either blue or green. And I can explain that if you've ever heard me talk about the quark and the th colors of the thrones, the emerald throne, the sapphire throne, and the sardis throne, then you understand why one represents Jesus, and that is a move of God for people to get saved. The other represents the Holy Spirit, and that is a move of God for people to, to see signs and wonders and miracles. And so when the Shekinah glory of God would show up, it would show up in one of those colors, and they said that when the Shekinah would show up, that they would just have people come in off the streets just to stand in the Shekinah, and they would be healed. I mean, the stories at Azusa are unbelievable. But what most people don't realize is it wasn't any kind of revival like we've ever seen. It was just people waiting on the Lord. It was just people coming out and seeking the Lord. They weren't even praying for each other that much. God would just fall in the room and do a sovereign work. And that's the kind of thing that we're beginning to see right now in this revival at Asbury. But it's not just at Asbury. There's also a revival that's broken out at Lee University, which is just right up the road. And I gotta tell you, I, I went there. I just wanted to be in the revival. So I went there this afternoon. I had staff meetings and all that, and I just told them, I said, I'm getting out of here. I'm going over to Lee. And I just went over to Lee, and I just sat there. And I'm gonna tell let me tell you what I saw. If I could explain it, I actually, I actually put it on Facebook and social media, just my own experience. But if I could explain it, the two words I would have to use to explain it is the word peace and the word Terry. And when I got in my car, uh, I, one of the things that happens a lot of times in these moves of God, even like when people would go to Brownsville, I've heard so many testimonies where people would go to Brownsville and they would just sit in the service and they, didn't re they were expecting something great to happen and it was more like a great service. Then they'd get in their car to go home and the glory would fall in the car. I've, I've heard that the glory fell on buses many, many times. It was just a normal service. People got saved, but nothing spectacular happened. And they would get back on the bus, and the glory would fall on the bus, and they would have a, an experience with the Lord that, that would stain them for the rest of their life. And when I walked out of there today and I got in my car, I didn't really want to leave, to be honest with you, because I'd sit there. I could only stay for about an hour and a half, and, and, and I just wanted to stay because the peace in that room was unexplainable to me. I, I can't even tell you. It was just like, it was like a, a total peace. And the other word I would use is Terry. Because when I, when I got in my car, it was like the Holy Spirit said to me, this is what it was like in the upper room before the Holy Spirit fell. They, they were not expecting tongues of fire. No one had ever mentioned that. They were not expecting to speak in tongues. No one had ever told them that. They were not expecting the sound of a rushing mighty wind. Jesus never told them that part. All he said was tarry in Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. And what I saw, and I haven't been to Asbury yet, but I plan to go. I want to tell you, I'm not missing whatever God is doing. I'm, if, I, if I can just get my feet wet in it just a little bit, I'm just going to go wherever God is moving and do whatever he's doing. That's I want it. And I've been waiting a long time to, to see what God is going to do in this generation. But what I saw was just young people waiting. I heard about five testimonies. Somebody would, sometimes it was quiet. You know, that's really unique for Pentecostal circles too because sometimes we won't let it get quiet. You know, if it gets quiet, somebody will break out and do something, you know, because they don't, they, we, we get strange in the quietness, but they weren't strange at all in it. They were sitting in the quiet and then somebody would walk up there and read a scripture from the Bible and then somebody else would walk up there and give a testimony. There was one young lady that came in this afternoon with a guitar and she didn't go to the front. There were no no musicians playing. It wasn't anything like that. There was no band playing. This young lady brought her guitar and sat in the back on the floor. 
And she just started playing a song and singing it, and the whole place joined in with her. And I'm telling you, it was just like the peace of God was coming in waves over the room. And I just didn't want to leave. I just honestly didn't. But I wanted to be here tonight, so I did leave. But I just wanted to. The peace was so thick that I just, I just wanted to sit in it. In those moments, there was not a care. There was not a worry. And what I felt like I was witnessing is tearing People waiting on the Lord. And I left there thinking, they're going to get their own Pentecost. I don't know what it's going to look like. It may not be tongues of fire. It may not be the sound of a rushing mighty wind. But I'm telling you, they are calling out to God. And they are waiting on him. And they are tearing in a room waiting on the presence of the Lord. And I believe that God sees rooms like that. And God is going to come down and do something miraculous in those students' lives. It's not going to be worked up. It's not going to be hyped up. It's not going to be manipulated by anybody. I'm telling you what I saw was absolutely beautiful it was just students responding and without any fear man they were just getting there was one kid and I, I I won't tell you what hour I was there so hopefully you won't pick him out but he was obviously from the athletic department he had on his attire this kid could not sing to save his life but he wanted to sing and he'd get up there and sing and nobody cared he was so off tune and everybody would just join him they'd pick up the melody and he would keep singing and and I mean he was really getting into it right and he was trying to put obligato and all this stuff in there, you know, ad lib in there. And, uh, and it wasn't working, but nobody cared because his heart was in the right place. And I tell you, man, it just brought tears to my eyes. I'm thinking, yeah, man, go for it. I'm tired of people thinking you gotta be perfect. I'm tired of people thinking if a light's out or if the sound isn't the right way or you forgot the words to a song, I'm tired of that. I'm ready to see something so pure and so genuine and so grassroots something. I want to hear some baby talk. I want to hear some baby steps. I want to see God do something absolutely gra grassroots. And, and, and I just sit back there, man. I, I could have got up and quoted some scriptures or said something, but I didn't want to say anything. I was mesmerized by just God moving and the way he was, he was moving that. Now, I told you I spoke at the ramp. Uh, the, I was there yesterday speaking in their school yesterday and also Sunday preaching in their church and I got a text from from uh, Rick Tao today and he said he said and, and I want you I want you to see this picture because this is actually this afternoon the ramp actually has an eight o'clock mandatory prayer meeting for all their students so all their students have to go pray at eight they started praying at eight and they're still praying right now it has broken out at the ramp the glory of God has settled and when this picture was taken, it was late this afternoon, and they have been there all day long in the presence of God. And if it's like all these other places, they'll be there all night long and all day tomorrow. I'm telling you, man, I'm so ready for this. I am so, I, 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 don't, want you, I don't want you to take this the wrong way, but I've had enough church in my lifetime. I, I don't need more church, but I need more God. I, I, I don't want you to take it wrong. I, I love the church, but I'm tired of having to do church a particular way and make everybody happy. And if they don't get their song and they don't, I'm tired of that. I just want to see the glory of God come down any way he wants to come down. Move, God, any way you want to move. It doesn't have to be my way. It doesn't have to be my song or my favorite version of the Bible. Just move, God, any way you want to move. God is up to something. God is up to something. One of the things I saw that was amazing in all these places Student-led, no leaders, spontaneous worship testimonies, repentance, no bands, no microphones, no program, just glory. And I want to tell you something. If you want to be a part of what God is doing right now, you're going to have to get used to glory. Because glory is not the same as anointing. Anointing is when God comes in hot. Glory is when God comes in cool. Glor anointing depends upon us. Anointing is oil flowing through us. He, he lights us on fire. We get all excited. He lights us on fire. And the, and the wick pulls the glory, pulls the oil up through us and it wears us out. But we go after God with everything we've got. That's God using you in anointing. That's not what glory is like. God doesn't need you in the glory.
God doesn't need your hand. He doesn't need your prophecy. He don't need that. When God works in glory, that's him all by himself. And that's what Adam and Eve experienced when they walked with God in the cool of the day. It does not look like hot. It looks like cool. It does not look like like, like a fire sometimes. It looks like peace a lot of times. So get ready to settle in the peace of God. Anybody ready to be engulfed? in the love of God. Anybody ready for for you to go to bed at night and lay down with the sweetness of the Lord dripping from you and not a care in the world because the peace of God. See, that's that's what the Holy Spirit wanted to give us tonight. He said, I want to give you a gift. I see your worry. I see your stress. But you don't have to live like that in the kingdom because we have a king who's on the throne and he's in charge. And when the glory of God moves, the glory of God moves differently. A few nights ago, I had this dream. um, This is the 14th, so it would be four nights ago. I just got through preaching that day, and I went to bed, and honestly, I was very tired. I'd just driven home, and I was was very tired, and Faith and I, both of us, I don't know why, we get up at 5 o'clock in the morning. I know that some people think that's insane. It's just when we wake up. And we go do our prayer time. She goes to a room and prays. And I go upstairs to my office and pray. And that's our routine. We do it every day. And this morning I woke up, that morning I woke up at 5. And I thought, man, I haven't even been sleeping in just a few hours. And I'm really tired. I, maybe I can get one more nap. And then I'll get up and I'll go do my prayer time. And when I closed my eyes, I went into a place that I can't even describe to you. That, that little picture on the screen is the best picture I can show you that it looked like. I saw something that looked very similar to that. It didn't look like light. I mean, it looked like it was had lights in it, but it wasn't like a fog. It wasn't like a mist. It wasn't even like a smoke. It was like that. It was like when, a, when the wick is going out and you kind of see it up in the air. That's what I saw, and it was blue, just like this color. I, I, that's why I wanted to try to show you a picture of it so you can understand. And in this dream, and I don't have, I've been praying, and some of you have been praying for me that God would give me spiritual dreams because I want to have them. And I haven't been having a lot in a long time, and I haven't had one in, in months. And I've been asking the Lord to show me this, and this is what I saw in this dream. When I, when, I, when I fell into this deep sleep, I saw this blue, this blue Shekinah, and I knew it was Shekinah, and it was about two feet off the ground like that. And this is what I saw. I saw people coming and laying people in it. I saw people carrying teenagers. I mean, I saw grown men and women carrying teenagers and laying them in this blue mist. And then they were getting healed. I don't know what they needed, but they were they were getting up saying, I'm whole, I'm healed. I saw them bringing children and laying them, laying them in this blue mist. And I saw children. I saw hurting children and broken children. I just saw lives being put back together. And when I woke up, I woke myself up saying this out loud. I was actually shouting this out loud, and it woke me up from this dream. I was saying, I want to see it. I want to see it, God. I don't want to dream about it. I want to see it. I want to see the Shekinah of God. I want to see it with my own eyes. And then before I knew it, I had said this out loud. I said, I will throw my whole schedule away. Just let me see it. I will be where that's at. I don't care where I'm scheduled to be, where I should be, where everybody thinks I should be. I will be where you are, God. I want to be where you are, God, and I will do whatever I have to do that. And it was something that just in that moment, just I, I don't know if any of you follow me on social media, but I was I was so hoarse from preaching. I have no voice, but I had to tell that story. And I actually growled out that dream a little bit in a video and had to display it because it messed me up. And I still can't forget it. It is like it still is alive inside of me because I know it's real. And I know that God is getting ready to do something. And here's what it looks like. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and restore their land. And the Lord says, revival is here. It's time to fan the flames of revival. It's time to fan it in prayer. You know how you fan the flames? You put breath into it. I don't know if you've ever watched anybody take one of those blowers and they'll blow it on a coal. The old folks used to do that. They'd build a coal fire and they'd take that blower 
blower just like that and it would put wind on it and the wind would make it spark up. That's why God said to, to Ezekiel, prophesy to the wind. He said, prophesy to the breath is the word he used. Prophesy to the breath. God needs somebody that will open their mouth and begin to fan the flames prophetically, fan the flames of what is going on. God is wanting somebody to cry out and ask God for this. So here's what we're gonna do tonight. First of all, I want Dante to come. I want Carrie and, and Clay to come. Christian, I want you to come. I want you guys just come on, come on up on the stage. I want you to join me right here on the stage. But before we do anything, I just want you to share some of the experiences that you're having. I, there, here comes Dante. He was, in the, he was in the booth. I want you guys to share. You guys were at Asbury, Clay and Kerry. Why don't you just share a little bit about what you saw there and what you feel is going on there at Asbury, Asbury University? Well, my wife and I, we were there uh, Sunday afternoon, probably about 4 o'clock we got there. And it was so packed. There were people playing out on the, on the courtyard in the, uh, in the schoolyard. There were people just laying out, kids playing, people sitting on the steps. And when we got in there, there were so many people. There were probably 1,800 to 2,000 people. And we, we just barely got into the actual chapel, the main chapel where this all started. And my back was up against the wall. That's how tight it was. And Carrie was beside me. And um, there was just a spirit of unity and peace. Like Dr. B said at Lee today was tearing in peace. There it was peace and unity. And there were people literally from all sorts of denominational backgrounds there just to worship God. And it wasn't this Pentecostal high. I've been raised, we've been raised in Pentecost, Pentecostal churches all of our life. We know what the high moments are. But this was like Dr. B says, it's the glory. It's, it's just it's relaxed. You feel peace in that place and unity with people that are there to worship God. And it's, it's student-led. It's, it's, not the, it's not the lights. It's not the show. It's not the in-ears. It's not the Nord. It's not the Hammond B3. It's just people. It's just kids, average people like you and me up there saying, God, we've had enough of religion. We've had enough of church. We just want Jesus. We want the glory. We want the power of God to come in. And I very well believe this could be the Brownsville of our generation of what's going on right there in Asbury that's going to the world. Um, as soon as we walked on that property, you could feel that peace, Dr. B, that you were talking about that you felt at Lee. There was so much life that was there. There was kids playing in the yard, and just it was so packed out that we could barely get in there. And just like Clay said, it felt like Brownsville, because I heard that during Brownsville, people would wait outside to get in line to even get in the church. And people are driving from all over. Today, I've seen someone driving 13 hours to go to Asbury to see what God is doing. And growing up in Cleveland and growing up around Lee University, we have a lot of talented people and gifted people. People. And I just want to say there was no in-ears like Clay was saying. There was no full band. It was just pure-hearted worship for God. And he was the only one being exalted. No man, no woman. It was just him. And, and this has been going on since Wednesday of last week. That's absolutely amazing. Days now. Christian, I know that you've spent how long? 12 hours or so? Eight, eight hours yesterday there at Lee? Um, the way that I could describe it is just like that. It was just all about the Lord. <laughs> there was just nothing in the way. It was just about the Lord. It wasn't about a certain person. And when the presence of the Lord came in, people were humbled and they started repenting. They started crying. <laughs> People came off of the football teams and the and they came out at like late at night and you could tell it's like they weren't the type of people to come to this and people were surprised when they walked in the room. <laughs> when the glory was in the room, <laughs> they fell to their knees and were weeping at the altar. <laughs> and true repentance came over them and people started repenting one to another. <laughs> It was like nothing I've ever seen, and I was there for eight hours, and I know it went way longer than that. And that is just what we need. We need to surrender to the Lord. We need to surrender our services to the Lord. Let him do what he wants to do. Praise God. Um, this is my third year as a Lee student, and 
I've been praying and dreaming of seeing something like this, and I know that this is a house that's shared that vision. And yesterday morning, before a class, I talked to a friend, and she was telling me how she had went up to Asbury over the weekend, and she asked if she'd like for me to be added to a group chat for some people that were going to have a prayer meeting. Well, a couple hours later after my class, I saw all of these messages going off in that group chat, and like everyone was being added to it. And so I go over to the chapel for that prayer meeting, and they were an hour in, and there's probably 30, 40 people in there, and everyone's just on their face, like Dr. B has already said, crying out for revival, crying out for God to come. And then I had to go to another class, and then by the time I came back later in the afternoon, they weren't praying for that revival to come. That revival was there. And I, I saw things that I have dreamed of, my friends who have told me for years that they weren't too sure about these things that the Spirit does, that they thought that that was weird and someone putting on a show walking into that room and getting filled with the Holy Spirit last night. My brothers and my sisters that I've been with for these years and I've longed to see God do this. I saw professors get up in the front and wash a student's feet and repent for the older generation not properly imparting uh, the gift to the next generation, and then those students turn around and repent to those professors and those leaders for the younger generation being in rebellion. And just like Christian, Kristen said, when you walk into that room, it is like you are in this peaceful presence of the throne room of God. When you walk in there, there's a peace that sweeps over everything, but there is a clarity of what is in your heart, and anything that is not of God has to go. And that has been true of students, professors, people from the community, and right now as we speak, they are still there. Uh, today we had a regularly scheduled chapel, and so the regular chapel that we have had to happen... And when I got there, the altar was already full before the chapel usually happened. Usually people are in there doing homework and waiting to just get their card scanned and get out of there. And people were crying out in spontaneous worship without any instruments in the normal chapel meeting. And this is already spreading across the campus. And I am so excited to see where God's going to continue to take it. I'm going to ask Jennifer to come up here with me as well. And you know, I don't want to put any of you guys on the spot, but if any of the other students have been going to the Lee Revival, if you guys want to say something, I mean, the mic is yours. You can just come up here. That's kind of how they've been doing it, and I'm totally good with that. If, you, if any of you guys want to, want to share any of your experiences. But I want us to do something tonight that is different than we normally. Come on up. There we go. Yes, come on up. That's what I want you to do. No, no, come on up here. Hi. <laughs> Um, not everybody here knows me, but I'm Dante's cousin. I'm just Lynn. <laughs> um, but I also go to Lee, and when the revival started yesterday, I remember Dante texting me and then running into me after he had left and going, you need to go to the chapel. If you're not in the chapel, like, right now, something's wrong. <laughs> um, and I was like, okay, so I have to go. I understand. I trust Dante. And I, I go, and I'm like, okay. Wow, I walked in that door even just today. And I've, my, like, D Baker's in the back, that's my boyfriend, he, where our friends went, and even they agreed with me. They said, as soon as we walked in that door, peace and overwhelming just God's presence just took control over us. And I have told our, our friends and everybody that I run into, even teachers that have not been there yet, to, to go and you have to see it. I don't care if you are scared of it or if you've never seen this before. If you have not been there, you need to be there. You cannot miss this. You need to go with an open heart. You need to see God. God is going to speak whatever way he wants to speak and he is doing it now. Do not miss God. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. I want you to stand all over the room I have asked some young people tonight who have a heart for revival to help us to fan the flames of revival. Now, how many of you have been to Global Prayer at least one time? All right. So some of you have not, so you may not know exactly what we do. So at Global Prayer every Thursday, when we pray, we just kind of walk around. We just, everybody just kind of walks around and prays. And we have somebody up here leading the prayer. So the band's going to play real softly in the background. We're not going to have anybody singing. They're just going to play very softly in the background. This is what I want you to do. I don't want you to listen to them pray. 
they're leading a prayer for the next few moments. This is what I'm, I feel the Holy Spirit is asking you and I to do. Fan the flames of this revival. He's calling upon us tonight to fan the flames. So if you want to see God move in this generation and change lives in this generation, and maybe you've already had a great revival for your generation, so, so you know what they're in for. But for the next few moments, as they pray, I'm going to ask you, if you want to come and kneel on the altars, if you want to kneel there in your seat but this is not a time to listen to them pray and clap you know this is not about that this is about you helping them pray so I, I'm not even going to pray I'm going to let this generation pray and I'm just going to ask the Lord to just use them to say what needs to be said but I want you to all of them you can begin to stir up this room already you can come to the front you can get in the aisles you can walk around but for the next few moments we're going to fan the flames it's what the Holy Spirit said just fan Fam the flames, put breath in it, put breath in it, begin to speak into it, call it out. God, do it now, bring revival now for this generation. Jennifer, I want you to start our prayer for us. Lord, we welcome you into this place, God. We have been asking for you. We have been looking for you. We have been searching far and wide, north and south and east and west. And even if we haven't consciously searched for you, our souls have. So in this place right now, We welcome you, God. We welcome you, God. God, we thank you for your promises and the prophecies that you have laid before us. We thank you for the spoken word of your people for generations. For this moment, God. And so we don't ask, God, that you come. We don't ask for revival anymore. We simply welcome your spirit, God, and say, move how you want to move. Use who you want to use. God, it is all about you. Let no one person be seen or elevated. Let no one see anyone but you. God, we pray in this moment right now that you would invade our spaces, that you would invade our hearts and our minds. And Father God, we've been set ablaze for you. And Father God, now we rest in you. Lord, thank you for coming. Thank you for filling us up. Thank you for meeting us where we are at. No titles. No elevation, God. No names. Just the creator with his creation. Walking with us in the cool of the day. God, we repent for our pride. We repent for our selfishness. We repent, God, for our minds inclined towards evil and our minds inclined toward ourselves. Forgive us, God, for not being the body you called us to be. Forgive us, God, for not fulfilling your great commission. 
And in this moment, God, we pray that everything that you have said would come, would come, God. Let the sons and the daughters prophesy now. Let the fathers turn to their sons and the daughters to their mothers, God. Let your glory fall now. We call down the hosts of angels. Invade this place, invade our spaces. We call the choir of heaven and say, raise up a sound. Raise up a sound. Raise up a sound. Raise up a sound in us. Lord, we thank you for this. We thank you, God, for all that you are doing. And I just pray right now that every heart of stone would turn to a heart of flesh and be receptive to your spirit, God. Let every wall be broken now in the name of Jesus. Let every hindering spirit be silenced now in the name of Jesus. I hear cancer. Cancer, we drive you from the body of Christ in the name of Jesus. We proclaim wholeness in the body of Christ in the name of Jesus. And now in this place, God, every person that has been diagnosed with cancer or whether they know they have cancer, I ask you to step forward if that's you and claim what God is saying right now. Be healed and made whole in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, God. Yes, Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you that you're raising up a generation of Davids in this hour. God, that have been overlooked, that have been picked over, God but you're calling them to go and get the glory back on behalf of a generation, to go and get the glory back on behalf of a nation, Father. God, our generation, we won't settle for the glory being somewhere else, God, but God, we need the glory here, God. Father, we desire the glory here, God, and so we go after the glory tonight, Father. God, there's a generation of Davids tonight, God, going after the glory on behalf of a generation tonight, Father, going on behalf of the glory for a generation and for a nation, Father. Oh, God, I thank you that you're raising up sons and daughters this night, God, in this hour, God, in this revival, God. You're raising up sons and daughters to prophesy, to dream dreams and to have visions, God, to do the work of the Lord, to do the work of the fivefold ministry, God, to go and proclaim the name of Jesus. Oh, God, I thank you, Father. I thank you that you're raising up a generation of Davids, God, God, whose destiny is bigger than the pasture they may find themselves in tonight, God. God, you're raising them up, Jesus. You're raising them up, God. We thank you for the glory, Father. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Father, you're raising up a generation of Davids that will wear the ephod of holiness once again, God. That will wear the ephod of righteousness once again, God that will wear the ephod of holiness once again, Lord, with a song in their heart and a melody in their soul, God, that will go and shift an atmosphere because of the glory. Oh, God. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Father, Malachi and John prophesied that in this revival, the hearts of the children would turn to their fathers and the hearts of the Father to their children, God. 
So God, let revival, let the flames of revival be fanned in the family tonight, God. God, families that have been destroyed, families that have been wounded by the attack of the enemy, God, we decree, declare, and prophesy healing and restoration in the name of Jesus that the hearts of the children would be turned to the parents, God, and the hearts of the parents would be turned back to the children, Father. And Father, to the marriage right now, whether you're in this room or watching by live stream, there's a marriage that needs a wedge pulled out and healing to come. I prophesy healing to a marriage right now in the name of Jesus. You're on the brink of divorce and it looks like it's all over with. But right now in the name of Jesus, there's a divine turnaround. And God is pulling out the wedge that's been put in you. And God is bridging the gap and healing and restoring in this moment in the name of Jesus. God, I thank you that you're raising up an Isaac generation. I thank you you're raising up a generation that's redigging the wells of revival. God, that's redigging the wells, God, that our forefathers dug. Oh God, I thank you, Lord. God, for the wells of revival. God, that are being redug in this nation. Oh God, this Isaac generation is redigging these wells, God, at Lee University, Lord. Oh, God, we thank you for the moves of God in the past, God. We honor those. God, we thank you, Lord, for in the 1950s, God, when they would have to cancel class because the glory of God would be so powerful that they would lay out in the streets, God, in front of the con center. Oh, God, we thank you for all of that again. But, God, we know you're going to blow a fresh breath of wind, God. God, on Lee University, God, that's a holy place, God. That's where prophets, men and women of God have been raised up. And God, I believe in decree, God, this revival is going to be sustained. Oh, God, they're going to keep putting wood on that fire. They're going to keep fanning that flame. Oh, God, I, pr I pray for Asbury University, God. Oh, God, that you would sustain, God, what's going on there, Lord. Oh, God, you visit them in the 1970s, God, and you're visiting them again 50 years later. Oh, God, I lift up every university, Ohio Christian University, Oral Roberts University, Evangel Christian University. God, I ask you to just visit them again, oh, God, every generation, God, that's hungry for you, oh, God. God, repentance, God, restoration, deliverance, God, you you cannot have this generation oh God the sons and daughters are prophesying just like in Joel chapter 2 God you're pouring it out you're pouring it out again oh God I pray for every Greek club God I pray for every athletic team God I pray for the ones that people have given up on and I say they will be a part of this revival they will live again says the Lord I prophesy to those dry bones and say live again live again in Jesus name oh God right now I pray for every pastor's kid every minister's kid that is away from you God and I say, call them back, God, to the God of their childhood. God, we call them back from the land of the enemy. And we say, you will live and not die. And you will declare the works of the Lord. God, bring back our children. Let them be a part of this end time revival, God, in the name of Jesus. I just want to speak to this moment for a second. I know that this might be awkward for some people, but I heard the Lord say that we're not waiting for revival to come, that revival is already here. And the Lord says, jump in. He says, jump into it. You might have to do something to jump in. And yesterday, I was at Lee for the first three hours that I sat there, I was a spectator and I didn't feel anything. And I was like, 
everyone's getting wrecked by God and I was just sitting there and I was trying to feel something. I was trying to catch this revival. I didn't feel anything. And for a moment, I was like, maybe I should just leave. And then something rose up inside of me and say, and I said to myself, I'm not gonna let everyone get touched except for me. And so I said, I'm either gonna leave or I'm gonna go up to that altar and I'm gonna contend for the glory of God to touch me. And I went up to that altar after three hours of sitting there and feeling nothing. And I said, God, I know that you're moving in this room and I'm gonna pull on it, God. I'm gonna hold on to what you're doing until you touch me. And I jumped into revival. I jumped into the river. And so right now it feels awkward. And some of you need to get out of your seat. You need to start jumping around. Around. You need to come to the altar. You need to repent. You need to start praying. You need to press in. It might feel uncomfortable, but if you don't get uncomfortable, you won't get your breakthrough. <laughs> Just like the man that was waiting at the gate, uh, the gate called Beautiful. They told him he was blind. They told him, stop, stop calling Jesus' name. He doesn't want you. And he said, son of David. <laughs> God, come touch me. God, we're crying out for revival. God, we're crying out with everything. God, everything that we have in us. God, all the breath. God, all the breath in our lungs. God, we need a touch. God, I pray that all of our prayers would go out the window right now because we are nothing without you. <laughs> God, we are the dust of the earth without you until your breath comes, until your breath breathes on us. <laughs> God, we're crying out. <laughs> Do something in our generation. Do something in this room, God. Touch hearts, Lord. Set us free, God. <laughs> God, we need you. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. The Holy Spirit is releasing a groan for him right now. <laughs> when words aren't enough, when you can't think of the words, the Holy Spirit is going to groan through you. There's a man that is back in the in the back in the dark of the room. It looks like you have like an orangey, ready colored shirt on. I feel something over you. Could you come forward? Yeah, you with a baby. Oh, Ramana, Rikiri, 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 Rikiri,
Lord, we invite you to do what you want to do tonight, God. Could I get some people to come pray for him? I don't know what the Lord wants to do for you tonight, but I just, like the Lord highlighted you. You were all the way in the back of the room. I could hardly see you. The Lord highlighted you to me. And I just know that the Lord has a calling and a purpose on your life. Maybe you know what that is already. And he is just acknowledging what he's spoken to you. And he's saying it will come to pass. And there's going to be more. Lord, pour more in him, God. God, I pray that you would pour more in him, God, than he thinks that he can even contain, Lord. God, and I just pray over him right now, Lord, that you would remove every bit of heaviness, every bit of residue from the old seasons, God, because he's coming into a new season tonight. Oh, God, we thank you. God, you are launching him now. You are launching him now, God. God, send him into his calling, God. God, make his hands ready for battle. God, set his hands, God, to the work that you have for him. In the name of Jesus, God. God, we plead your blood over him, God. God, let the anointing flow like a river over him in the name of Jesus. God, we thank you. We say, so be it in the name of Jesus. It's Jesus, Jesus. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. Lord, we acknowledge your presence, God. We see you in this room. We see you in this city and we see you in this nation. We see you in this world, God. Lord, we see that it is you. And God, we want to see more of you, Jesus. Lord, search our hearts in this room and search our hearts across your church, God, that we don't chase a hype, that we don't chase a moment, but God, that we would chase your face again, Jesus. Search our hearts, God, search our hearts. Lord, I cast down divided hearts in this room right now. We give you total submission in this moment, Jesus. Total submission to your plan. Lord, even the things that we might think are of you that are outside of the line and the timing of your calling, we say they have to go. Lord, we call ourselves into alignment with your calling, with your timing, and we ask that you would search our hearts and reveal to us all that is selfish, Jesus. Reveal to us. Reveal to us even when we're serving you for ourselves and not simply because you are worthy of it, Jesus. Come on, church, pray, God. God, move in this room, Jesus. Search our hearts. Oh, Jesus. I hear the prayer of Evan Roberts in this room right now. Bend me. Bend me, oh God. Bend me. Bend me, oh God. Bend me, bend me, oh God. We want total submission, God. We want total submission, Jesus. Lord, we're not looking for a platform. We're not looking for a microphone. We're looking for you to move. It doesn't have to look like it looked before. And it doesn't have to look like what we've gotten used to, but we want to see you move, Jesus. Jesus, move in this generation. Lord, I speak forth boldness in my generation. I speak forth boldness and a courage to answer the call that's on their life. Jesus, Jesus, God, I thank you for healing. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing across the colleges of this campus. And I thank you that there is a generation, a generation that has been hurt, a generation that has grown up in the church and they've heard about your spirit, but they've seen, they've seen people in the church twist those things and you pursue selfish motives, God. Or they've seen selfish and perverted and divorced attentions from what your word says. And God, that has given them a false perception of you. And I cast that down in Jesus' name. God, I speak that thousands of students in this week are coming back to who you are. God, they knew you growing up and they ran away. And some of them didn't even run away from you, but they ran away from the promises of the gifts of your spirit because they didn't trust it anymore. But I speak that a trust and a peace is rising again. 
a trust and a peace is rising up in this generation. God, we open our hearts to you again. We tear down walls, Lord. Help us to tear down those walls. Jesus, Jesus, your glory is coming to these campuses, God, and it will spread. Lord, let it burn and let it be about you, undoubtedly you. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, your name be glorified, God. This is all for your glory. This is all for your glory, God. Your name will be high and lifted up and you will draw all men unto you. You said that if your people who are called by your name will humble themselves, God, that is the first thing you call us to. So I ask that you would humble us tonight, Jesus. Humble us tonight, God. Humble us, help us to see our hearts, God. Help us to see it. Bend us, bend us, bend us. Bend us away from our own intellectual egos that we've built up in the classroom. Bend us away, God. Bend us away from feeling that because we can pick up a microphone and shout that that means we have the power of your word because it doesn't. Bend us away because thinking that we've seen a bunch of other people do it, that we as a generation can stand up and just repeat what they've done. Bend us from these things, God, and give us your glory. Give us your glory in its place, your Shekinah power. Would release your Shekinah glory across these campuses. I see headlines changing in this nation. Headlines of colleges will no longer say shootings, they will say Shekinah. Shekinah glory is what identifies the college of the United States. Shekinah glory is what identifies this generation across the world. Lord, there is a peace being released across that is going to tear down, Lord, it's going to tear down the constructs of division. It's going to tear down the constructs of violence, God. I contend for my nation. I contend for my generation, Jesus, and we stand here in the gap. We stand here in the gap as a family tonight, Lord. Lord, release your presence, God. Release your presence in this room. Release your presence in this nation. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus.
Lord Jesus, I just pray, God, from the front of the room to the back, Lord, I pray that every single person in here, God, would be able to feel your presence. God, I pray that no one would leave this place, God, without feeling you, God. God, I pray that no one would be able to leave this place without knowing that you are real, God. God, I ask that you would make yourself real to us tonight. God, make yourself real to us. Lord, when Elijah called down fire from heaven, God, you made yourself real, God, to a people that didn't know you. God, so I just prophesy right now, God. God, and I say that you are going to reveal yourself, God, to people that aren't seeking you, God. God, to people that just got drug here, God, and don't even want to be here, God. You are revealing yourself to them now. In the name of Jesus, you are, you are revealing yourself, God, to the prodigals. God, you are revealing yourself, God, even people watching online who just tuned in on accident. This was not an accident. This was not a coincidence. God, I pray that your presence, God, would invade right now. God, I pray that the tangible, God, heavy glory, God, would fill this room, God, and would fill the room, God, of every single person watching, God. God, I pray that they would say that there is no God like Jehovah. There is no God like the God that I saw tonight. God, I pray that you would make yourself real, God. God, and I pray that every other idol would fall tonight. God, every other thing, God, that we have put in your place, God, everything that we have put in your place, God, God, like Dagon, I pray that it would fall and be broken tonight, and I pray that it would never rise again. God, every single thing that has taken, God, the affections of our heart, Lord, I pray that they would fall, and God, and I pray that you would be the love of our lives. Lord, like Mary broke her box of alabaster on your feet, God. We pour our worship and our praise unto you tonight, Jesus. Lord, we want to be pleasing to you, God. Let our worship, let our prayers be sweet, a sweet aroma to your nostrils tonight, oh God. I pour my love on you. Jesus, 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 praise is like perfume. I lavish mine on you till every drop is gone. I pour my love on you. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Like oil upon your feet, like wine for you to drink, like water from my heart. I pour my love on you If praise is like perfume I lavish mine on you Till every drop is gone I pour my love on you Father, we pour it out tonight, Jesus Pour it out tonight, Jesus. Lord, we sit at your feet tonight, God. Lord, we sit at your feet tonight, God. God, in a world of religion, God, in a world of religious routine and activity, God, we break the cycle tonight, God, and we pour our box of alabaster to your feet, God. God, we pour our alabaster on your feet tonight, God. We wipe, we wipe your feet with our hair, God, God, because it's all the glory is yours, Jesus. All the glory is yours, Jesus. Like oil upon your feet, like wine for you to drink, like water from my heart. Pour my love on you If praise is like perfume We lavish mine on you Till every drop 
cup is gone I pour my love on you Like oil upon your feet Like wine for you to drink Like water from my heart I pour my love on you Praise is like perfume, then I lavish mine on you till every drop is gone. I pour my love on you. <laughs> Who, Jesus. Let us be acceptable vessels in your sight, God. Cleanse us from all uncleanliness. Soften every sharp edge. God, we pour our love on you. I just can't get away from this. Um, earlier today, the Lord was speaking to me, and I'm not a songwriter. I've never been one. And I've never been able to put a melody together for myself. And the Lord gave me something. And it was just a small piece. And I said, God, is this all? And he said, no, I have so much more, but this is just the beginning. And so if you don't mind, Dr. B, I'd like to share that. Braden, can you get my purse for me? I have it in there. says, O oh God of revival, hear our cry from this holy place, and let your kingdom come to earth. Let your fire burn over the plains, and let your spirit be released to your people on their knees. We are desperate for more of you. And so come and make all things new. Let 
your fire burn over the plains. Let your spirit be released to So come and rest and make things new. Make us look like you. Let your choir of heaven raise their praise to you. Oh God of revival, hear our cry. Oh God of the kingdom we come before you oh Lord it all God <laughs> voice of heaven come There's somebody in the room that you've watched this whole service and you don't know this God that we serve you don't you believe this is all a show but I'm here to tell you tonight whoever you are God heard your thoughts and he's telling you that he sees you and he will not stop until you have experienced his spirit. And if you want to receive that, the thing that you have been so longing for, but so rejecting, I just pray that you would open your heart right now. God is saying, I am pouring my spirit upon all flesh. And that includes you. I have had my eye on the sparrow. I have had my eye on the sparrow. And will I not feed you? I will not let your shoes wear out. And I will not let you go hungry. For I, the Lord your God, split the sea before you. And I am making what is impossible possible. 
I, the Lord, am your God. If I care for one, will I not care for all? Thank you, Jesus. testimony I felt led to share. Um, growing up, I always had problems with my knees. It kind of is a generational thing, and like my dad and my grandpa had like knee surgeries and stuff, and I, I, my knees just always hurt, and um, I couldn't go like this. I couldn't get down on my knees, and I loved to worship like this, but I couldn't. It would just hurt after like five minutes of it, and um, I remember one day we were in worship at camp, and um, I just got lost in the presence of God. There wasn't like a altar call. It wasn't a healing call. There wasn't any like words of knowledge given. We were literally just worshiping God. I don't even know what song it was. And I just, I got on my knees and I had my hands lifted. And I felt this like swirling in my knees. It felt like a cloud come over my knees, both of my knees at the same time. And while I was worshiping God, before I knew it, my knees were getting healed. And I got up and I started jumping around and I realized all the pain that I lived with my knee in, in my knees was gone. And I could do something that I could have never done. And God healed me in that moment and it wasn't because someone prayed for me. It was just because I got lost in his glory. And when his glory comes, it changes things. And so I just felt to share that. That happened so many years ago. And I know that the Lord told me to share that. And so I want to prophesy in the room right now 
that if you're sitting there and you have problems in your body, you need healing, worship him. And as his glory comes down, he's going to heal you. I believe that there's healings that have happened and you're not going to realize maybe until in the morning when you wake up, you're not going to realize until you're driving home and you realize something doesn't hurt. But I believe that God is healing right now. And if you have a specific need, maybe you need to come up and maybe people can pray for you or maybe you just need to come up and kneel whatever the Holy Spirit is ministering to you, but I believe that the Lord is releasing healing right now in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray over every body. God, I plead the blood of Jesus over every body, God. And we declare that, God, what you did on the cross was enough to heal our bodies. God, it's enough to heal the smallest bodies to the biggest bodies, God. God, the 90-year-olds and the 6-year-olds, God, there's no one that you can't heal. And there's nothing that you can't heal, Lord. God, and we just praise you as creator as God, as the one who made us from dust, Lord. God, and we say that even generational curses have no place in our bloodline, have no place in our bloodline. God, that what you did on the cross, that changes our bloodline. And I declare right now that people are walking out of this building tonight healed, that there's going to be a testimony of Jesus, that they are healed by you, God. And it will be because not because anyone touched them, not because I said this, but because you are in the room. God, we thank you. God, I just thank you for the inner healing that you're doing in this room as well. God, I thank you, God, that you can do in a moment, God, what counseling has to take 10 years to do, Lord. God, I thank you that you're revealing the things of the heart, Lord, and you're healing them, God. God, I thank you that you can heal emotional wounds, God. God, I thank you that you can heal people that have been abused, God, and their hearts are heavy, God. God, I thank you that you see them right where they are, Lord. God, and that you can heal that wound in them, God. God, you can make them whole as if it had never happened, Lord. God, I pray right now that anyone who has suffered abuse, who has suffered torment, God, God, I pray that you would remove those things even from the very memories of it, God. God, I declare that there won't be any flashbacks, there won't be any nightmares. God, that you are healing the inner wounds right now, Lord. God, you are touching us in the deepest places. God, we thank you, God, that you are an intimate God and that you see every single care that we have. thank you right now God Lord we thank you that Lord sometimes when the glory shows up we don't really have much to say Lord 
And God, our words sometimes can't, we can't put to words, Lord, what we, what you, what we need to say, God. Lord, we just thank you for showing up, God. Lord, like they said, that no man is elevated, just Jesus, Lord. And we're getting back to him. The one with eyes like fire, hair like wool, feet like brass. Your voice is many waters. And Jesus, you're shining like the sun in all its strength. Lord, I just thank you, Lord, that someone, Lord, who's had either a parent, a father, both parents walk out on them when they were younger. Lord, you're bringing healing to their heart. They may be in the room. They may be watching, God. But I thank you for healing their heart, God. I just feel like the Lord's healing someone's vision, too. It's a physical eye problem. And the Lord's healing that right now in the name of Jesus. Oh, God, we just thank you, Lord, that when the glory shows up, when the glory's in the room, like that song says, nothing else matters, God. Lord, we thank you that there's no, nothing we can mimic, Lord, nothing we can try to conjure up in our own strength, Lord, but you're coming, Lord, in all your sovereignty, Lord, in all your power. Jesus, I pray that you break, you destroy all idolatry in our lives, God. God, you're a jealous God, Lord. We pray that you come in all that jealousy and all your love for us, God, and consume everything that is not like you, God. God, I pray 2 Corinthians 3, that, Lord, as we behold the face of Christ, you will conform us and transform us more and more into that image of glory. Lord, this is what's been prophesied even over this house, OCI, God. Lord, I believe it's just kicking off right now, God, of years that a prophecy, Lord, that, we, that we've been told, Lord, but now we're getting to see it with our eyes, God. Lord, I just declare right now, put you in remembrance of your word, the prophetic word that went forth years ago, that we are guardians of the sacred fire. We're guardians of the sacred fire. We're guardians of the sacred fire. Oh, 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 Lord, I pray that what's happening here, Lord, it's just going to continue to spread, Lord. God, please make us more aware of eternity. Grip our hearts with eternity tonight, Lord. Make heaven more real to us than ever before. Make hell more real to us than ever before, God. Lord, use us to snatch souls out of the fire, God. Please burden us for souls, Lord. Oh, hey, Rabbi. Burden us for lost souls, God. Let us see what you see. Let us see them how you see them, God. Oh, I'm just going to be obedient. There may be someone watching online. You may be in the Roman. In fact, you may have dabbled into witchcraft. But the Lord's letting you know that he's so real. And he's coming to fill your heart right now. And you will begin to experience the gifts of the Spirit. Words of knowledge, words of prophecy. And when the Lord shows up, like in 1 Corinthians 14, and the gifts are moving, prophecy especially, the, the people's hearts are exposed, secrets are exposed, and they say, God is really among us. Lord, let everyone know your tangible love right now. I pray Ephesians 3. That out of your glorious riches, Lord, you would strengthen us with power through, your inner, through our inner man so that Christ dwells in our heart through faith. And I pray that we being rooted and established in love may have power together with all your holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Oh, that surpasses knowledge that we are filled to the measure of all the fullness of you.
Lord, I pray Ephesians 1, <laughs> that you would give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you, the eyes of our understanding being enlightened in order that we may know the hope to which you have called us, the riches of your glorious inheritance and your holy people and your incomparably great power for us who believe. Lord, let witty and give people witty inventions. Give them divine appointments, Lord. Let, let, let book writings come out of this meeting, Lord. Let the gifts, as Dr. B prays, let the gifts that have been lying dormant, Lord, be come to life right now. It's already in them, Lord. We call it to life right now. We call it to spark. We call it to spring forth, God. And Lord, we just come in agreement once again with that word that William Burnham spoke, that Cleveland, Tennessee will be an end time hub of revival. Oh, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. Glorify your name, Lord. of your presence we your people give you reverence so arise to your bliss and be blessed by our praise as your glory as your presence fills this place as your presence now fills this place
to worship you, O my soul, rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Thank you, Jesus. I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice to Let it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.